Vulnerable Afghans, especially women and girls, are expected to be fast-tracked to the UK under new resettlement schemes. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has said the UK is looking at a bespoke arrangement for Afghan refugees, with details to be set out by the Home Secretary and Prime Minister in due course. It's thought the support would be similar to that used to help Syrian refugees, but some other European political leaders have expressed concern about the possible influx of migrants due to the Taliban's takeover. Shabnam Nasimi is the director of Conservative Friends of Afghanistan, a political business and diplomatic forum aimed at building a more meaningful and stronger relationship between the UK and Afghanistan. Shabnam, welcome to the show. There's a lot of discussion at the moment that the priority should be given to women and children. Perhaps that's to combat the negative perception that we might currently have about immigration of largely being young men coming over in boats. But do you agree with that? Do you agree with prioritising females, given perhaps that they're the most at risk of persecution by the Taliban? Or should we be looking at a, a more inclusive and wider scheme if we look at anything at all? Hi, Alex. Thank you so much for uh, having me on. Look, I think the situation is shocking, it's saddening, and it's definitely uncertain. And we've been working at the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan with MPs uh, uh, within the Conservative Party to make sure that uh, the necessary support and protection is given to Afghans at this critical time. Um, I understand the concern over the fact that this conflict and this crisis will escalate and that it, it will end up within our shores. What I need to really clarify here, though, is that we knew that Afghanistan is a regional, uh, the issue in Afghanistan is a regional crisis, not just an Afghan crisis. It's why we went to Afghanistan in the first place. So it, it, the, the argument, um, I guess, against immigration is unjustified at this present moment, mainly because we could have prevented that by not withdrawing at this specific time in this irresponsible manner, I guess. Um, secondly, in terms of inclusivity, I think I'm, uh, of course, I, I want to make sure that there's no, you know, there's no difference between men and women, and particularly the men that served in Afghanistan, translators, interpreters, and the Afghan soldiers who, who fought side by side with, with foreign forces. I want them to be protected as well. But unfortunately, under the Taliban regime, and we've seen this uh, historically, we've, you know, we saw this in the late, late 1990s, it's the women that pay the biggest price, uh, having to be imprisoned at home, uh, killed, punished, stoned, uh, shot. It, it's the women that end up suffering the most. And the women that we are trying to get protection for are the journalists, the uh, professionals, the educated, uh, the ones that worked for civic uh, space and were activists, the ones that work for the government, those that had a really vocal voice against the Taliban, against oppression, and th these are the, 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 the very individuals who will be targeted by the Taliban, no matter what they say. Um, you know, I, I'm sure, like many viewers, viewers and, and British, uh, people in Britain may have seen in the media that Taliban are saying they've changed and that, you know, they will allow women to go work and to study, etc. But I think we, you know, we can see it for us, ourselves and we've, we've seen past history and the track record of the Taliban with the amount of attacks and brutality uh, in, in which they, they've taken Afghanistan by force, that it's, it's difficult to believe their words that, that they've changed. Uh, I, no, I quite agree. And the evidence on the ground doesn't look like they've had much of a glow up at all, frankly. Uh, we can tell there's an election coming up in France, can't you? Because President Macron has been extremely assertive on this, saying we're worried about a, a migrant crisis, a load of people crossing the borders. And it's very much, I think, playing to the gallery. But there are a lot of people in Britain who say we can't. It, it's a desperate situation. Yes. But we can't house people from whichever country suddenly needs refuge. We can't keep expanding our own society and perhaps chipping away at our own culture by doing this. So what number is appropriate? I mean, if we're going to look at the numbers of people who may need to be uh, relocated and resettled in safe Western countries, how many people should Britain be looking to take in? Well, look, I, I'm, I've always argued that we've got to make sure that immigration is lowered so that we can ensure that it doesn't put a strain on British infrastructure our economy and our society. But when in times of crisis, I think politics and all of that aside, this is not a political debate. This is a, a humanity debate. And if Britain's one of the 
leading humanitarian actors around the world. We, you know, we talk about global Britain. That comes with a sense of responsibility. Now, I understand that um, the Britain can t take, you know, a certain number. I would like to see safe passage and legal ways for them to come in first of all, so that we can prevent extremists, criminals, uh, offenders from coming to our to our shores and to our to our land. So there, there is that that. That, uh, that route of taking it to make sure that we can do our checks, our, um, uh, our thorough process in terms of who we invite to the UK, that will prevent a lot of chaos. But more importantly, it's about uh, Britain working together with our allies and friends around the world and putting pressure on them to take refugees. I, and, you know, I'm all for understanding that there is a limit to how much we can support them, but at least we've got leverage, we've got that, um, th th that power to make sure that we en encourage and uh, advise other nations around the world, particularly the you know, neighboring regions around Afghanistan, Iran, India, Pakistan, Central Asia, to open their borders and to allow Afghans to flee. Now, that, that seems like a very practical route, and I'm sure a lot of Brit uh, uh, British people would agree. So it's, my campaign is, is towards that as well. I'm not simply just saying that we need to take them all in and we've got a responsibility. I think everyone has a responsibility to take a fair share, and this needs to be a global effort. You describe this as a humanitarian crisis, and I don't agree with you. I don't disagree with you at all with that description. I think it quite evidently is. Uh, but you, you have personal connections in Afghanistan. You, you have heard stories from women on the ground. Tell us what, what, what are their fears? What is it really like right now in that country? Well, every moment my phone has been ringing for the past three or four days, I get texts from women, from men, from people who've served in the army, uh, and specifically those that uh, fought with the British, saying that the Taliban are now patrolling every house, door to door, looking for people. There are, they're, they're seizing property, they're seizing cars, they're seizing weapons, um, and they're looking for individuals. It is a very frightening situation. I mean, I came here, to, I came to the UK in 1999, two years before 9-11, very young, so I don't recall much of, uh, of, of, of Taliban rule. But I do know that imagine, you know, living in a society where you're told how, what to, dre uh, how to dress, what to say, where, uh, that you can't work, that you can't study, that you're supposed to be a certain individual. And if you fall outside of that line or those, I guess, Sharia law in, in accordance to what the Taliban want, then, you know, there are punishments and consequences. That is a brutal society. And sometimes we fail to understand the human aspect of this. You know, we, we hear the news, we hear the conflict, and we think it's something that's happening in a faraway land, and it might not be as, 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 as uh, it's portrayed or, or, or as the media um, states. But actually, in reality, my own family members, friends, people who are on the ground are constantly telling me that they see a very bleak and dark future on the Taliban rule. They've experienced it once they don't want to experience it again. And I think one final note to mention here, when Britain went into Afghanistan, it went in to promote democracy, human rights, and liberal rights, and, and sort of uh, uh, Western values. It's something that the British, uh, that the Afghan people accepted, wanted, embraced. They wanted to live under those values. Now that we've taken that away, it, it's not only a betrayal for them, but I think it also questions what it means for us to be global Britain, what it means for us to promote these values around the world and yet take it away from a country that, that so desperately needed it. Afghans didn't kick uh, uh, the world out or NATO or the US or, or Britain. You know, you weren't forced to leave. You, you, you left out of choice. So... To, to argue that, that the, law, the war was lost and that they didn't want us there, it is not, it's, it's completely incorrect. From what I see and from what I hear, Afghans wanted a progressive, democratic, free society, and it's something we've taken away from them. So the reality now, moving forward, is very, very uh, grim. And you've seen scenes already um, on social media of you know, Afghans gripping onto the uh, US military uh, plane, um, and some of them actually died whilst the airplane was taking off. Again, showing the desperation that they'd rather die in the air and grip to the airplane so they can move outside of, of Afghanistan rather than stay there and live under Taliban rule. 